Hello, my name is Nelly Mabasa. If you're one of those people that don't know why you should bother spending your valuable time doing science homework, then the series we are starting today is one you should not miss. In this series, we will investigate the physics topic of forces and momentum. There are hundreds of examples of forces in action in our everyday lives. The fact that humans don't float around in the atmosphere, but have their feet firmly on the ground, can be explained by the scientific laws that deal with forces. Understanding forces can also help you become better at your chosen sport, and it can even save your life. Before we continue, let's have a look at what we want to achieve in today's lesson. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe what force is, state and apply Newton's third law, draw free body force diagrams, and describe the effects of force. Now, you should have heard about forces in physical sciences before. For example, I'm sure you remember that all objects on Earth are subject to the force of gravity. You should also be familiar with the forces of attraction and repulsion between the poles of two magnets and the electrostatic force that exists between charged objects. Keeping what you already know about forces in mind, let's look at some examples of forces in action a little more carefully. I'd like us to see if these examples can tell us exactly what force is, scientifically speaking. What are the things that are similar in all these examples? Do you notice that there are always at least two objects or bodies interacting in each of these examples? Do you also see that in all the examples there is either a pull in a specific direction or a push in a specific direction? Considering these observations, do you think that you could try to formulate a definition for force? Force is a pull or a push that results from the interaction between two bodies. A force always acts in a specific direction. How did you do? Were your conclusions similar to mine? I'm sure they were. It is important for you to remember that when we describe a force, we must first identify the agent that is exerting the force. In other words, what is exerting a force on a body or an object? Then we have to specify the size or magnitude of the force, as well as the direction of the force. This means that force is a vector. Remember, a vector is something that has both magnitude and direction. Now, Force can be divided into two main groups. The forces that we recapped at the beginning of the lesson, magnetism, gravity, and electrostatic forces, are called non-contact forces. These forces act over a distance, which means that objects don't have to touch each other to experience a force. This type of force normally has a force field associated with it. The second group of forces are called contact forces. These include a direct push or pull, frictional forces, and air resistance. Here the bodies or objects that are interacting physically have to touch each other in order to exert a force on each other. Well, I hope that you're starting to get a pretty good idea of what force is. And if it is not crystal clear yet, don't worry, it will become clearer as we work through more examples. Next, I would like to show you how we measure force. In other words, how we find the magnitude or the size of the force exerted. We measure the magnitude of force using a spring balance. The stretch of a spring is proportional to the force acting on it. In other words, a spring stretches more when a larger force acts on it than it does when a smaller force acts on it. This is the principle on which the spring balance is designed. The SI unit of force is the Newton to honor the work done by Sir Isaac Newton in the latter part of the 17th century. So this spring balance measures the size of a force in Newtons. The 
the reading shows us that the apple exerts a force of 2 newtons. Let's go to a school playground and measure the forces in a tug of war using a couple of spring balances. Guys, you look like you're really enjoying your game. Okay, do you guys want to know the science behind the game that you play? Sure. Okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to measure the force with which you're pulling against each other, okay? We're going to take the two guys, okay? What's your name? Zueli. Zueli and? Tapelo. Okay, you guys grab each side of this. And now you're going to pull against the spring balance. It looks as if Tapelo and Zueli are both pulling with a force of 50 Newton. Okay guys, now pull harder and let's see what happens. Now you're both pulling with a force of 70 Newton. Okay Dineo, why don't you switch with Zueli? <laughs> Now the spring balance shows a reading of 50 newtons on both sides again. It seems that no matter who it is that is pulling, the forces are always of the same magnitude. But they're not really exactly the same, are they? What about these forces is different? We're pulling in opposite directions. That's right. They are opposite in direction. The simplest way to show the direction of a force is by using a sign. Let's say that the force to the right is positive 50 newtons. Then the force acting to the left must be minus 50 newtons. This shows that the magnitude of the forces are the same, but they pull in exactly the opposite direction. They have an opposite sign. Sir Isaac Newton made similar observations when he studied the way bodies or objects interact with each other and he described these observations in his third law. Newton's third law states that if body A exerts a force on body B, then body B exerts a force equal in magnitude and opposite in direction on body A. You may be more familiar with the version of this law that says for every action there is an opposite but equal reaction. This is an incredibly important scientific law. This applies to every interaction between two bodies or objects. There are no exceptions. But that doesn't sound right. If the forces are equal but opposite, then why did Dino move? The forces should have cancelled each other out. That is a good question and a common problem when people try to interpret Newton's third law. Let me try to explain with a simple diagram. <laughs> when Tapelo, body A, is pulling Dineo, body B, towards him, he is exerting a force of positive 50 Newton on Dineo, body B. Newton's law says that at the same time, Dineo is exerting a force that is also 50 Newton, but opposite in direction. We write it as minus 50 Newton. These forces are what make the rope taut, but there are other forces acting on Tapelo and Dineo that are not equal. The reason that Dineo starts to move towards Tapelo is not due only to the force in the rope. For example, you can see that Dineo has less mass than Tapelo. In addition, the force of friction between Dineo and the ground may also be less than the force of friction between Tapelo and the ground. It is the effect of the differences in these other forces that result in Dineo moving. Does that clear it up for you? It does, thanks. The action force, my pull, affects Dineo's, and the reaction force, Dineo's pull, affects me. They can't cancel each other out because they don't affect the same person. We have to think about the other forces that also acts on us to explain why one of us moves and the other doesn't. Great. I think you guys get it. Now I have to go back to studio. I'll see you guys. Bye. 
The diagram that I used to explain Newton's third law on the playground is called a free body diagram. Free body diagrams are the tools that we use in science to represent forces acting on a body. So let's practice the skill as well as our understanding of Newton's third law by looking at another example. Here we have a book lying on a table. Before we analyze the forces acting in this scenario by drawing a diagram, let me first explain some of the basics of drawing a free body diagram. Forces act through the center of mass of a body, so we can represent the object or body as a dot. The dot shows the position of the center of mass of the body. And this is where we start the arrow that represents the forces that act on the body. The length of the arrow represents the magnitude of the force, and the arrowhead points in the direction in which the force acts. Remember, to describe a force, we need to identify three things. The agent that is exerting the force needs to be identified. We need to specify the size of the force and we need to show the direction which the force acts on the object. Let's return to thinking about the forces operating on the book and the table. We'll begin by considering the interaction between the book and the table. Remember, all objects on Earth are pulled down due to gravity. The Earth must be exerting a force on the book. We call this downward force the weight of the book and can draw in an arrow downwards. So we can say that the weight of the book acts down on the surface of the table. Let's assume that the value of the force is equal to 5 Newton downwards, written as minus 5 Newton. But we know from Newton's third law that there must always be a pair of forces. So if the book exerts a force on the table, the table must exert a force on the book. Can you tell what the magnitude and direction of this force are? Well, by applying Newton's third law, we can say that the table exerts a force on the book that has the same magnitude as the weight of the book, but acts in the opposite direction. In other words, upwards. In this case, it must be plus 5 Newton. This upward force is an example of the normal force. We will look at this normal force in more detail later in this series. In the interaction between the book and the table, the pair of forces can be called contact forces because the book and the table are touching each other. But you will notice that the weight of the book is actually due to the interaction between the earth and the book. In this case, the earth and the book are separated by a distance. The book and the earth are not in direct contact. Does Newton's third law still apply here? Yes, it does. Remember, we said that there are no exceptions to Newton's third law. This means that we have to consider the force the book exerts on the earth. The book must be pulling the earth upward with a force that is equal in magnitude to its weight. That's quite something, isn't it? All the objects on the earth that are subject to a downward gravitational force are actually pulling the earth upwards with an equal and opposite force. Finally, I would like us to look at a few more examples of force in action to find out the effect of force when it acts on a body. Force can accelerate things. The greater the force the cyclist exerts on the bike pedals, the greater his acceleration. Force also slows things down. When the cyclist applies the brakes, he uses the frictional force between the tires and the ground to stop his bike. It takes force to change the direction of motion. This sportsman is continually swinging this hammer on a chain around in a circle. If the chain breaks or if he lets go, the hammer carries on moving in a straight line because there is no longer a turning force acting on it. Force can also change the shape of things. Forces can squash, stretch, bend, and even break objects. To summarize, we can say that force has the ability to change the type of motion of a body, the direction of a body's motion, and the shape of a body, and even to break things. So, does knowing how forces act help us to minimize force in a motor car accident? What are essential safety features to help us save lives in a car accident? We will find answers to these types of questions as we learn more about motion and force. Before I say goodbye, please take down your task for today. Here is a girl playing with a model motor boat. With the remote control, she sends a radio signal to the boat and this signal adjusts a switch to speed up the boat's motor and its propeller. 
Apply Newton's third law to this scenario by drawing a free body diagram labeling the forces between the boat and the water. In the next lesson, we will discuss momentum and the part that it plays when bodies interact with each other. Join me then. Yeah.